Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Bible study on Book of Proverbs takes place on Wednesday, 6.30 to 8.30. We have very good conversations about wisdom and foolishness and everything that falls in between, right? It's an amazing conversation. Everybody's invited. Great fellowship. Our reading today is from Acts chapter 4, verse 32, to Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, A Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias was with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard it these things. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem, and more than ever believed, more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. That as Peter came by, at at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to cheat, teach. Now, When the high priest came and those who were with them, 
they called together the council, all the Senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things, and so it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. Came to nothing. <laughs> After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We keep talking about the mission of God, uh, the church in the Acts of the Apostles and today. So uh, when we think about church in general, is it an organization? Is it a building? Is it certain structure, hierarchy? What is it? And if you look at the book of the Acts, you will see that church, church of God, the church of God is actually something that God himself is doing and building. As the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, he says that the Holy Spirit is the architect and he is the builder of God's church. So we today, we who are sitting in this sanctuary today, We can talk about God in terms of our personal relationship with God and how God can bless us and protect us and take care of us and give us peace and give us job. And, you know, we can talk about that. But we can see in the scriptures that God has a bigger mission and he wants us to be involved. Actually, he cannot build his church without people. So we are 100% involved. And we have a role in his church, right? That is why thinking about God's mission 
And thinking how we are involved can change how we do church, what we think about church, how we reach out to the unchurched, try right, to uh, everybody who is not a believer. So in John chapter 17, Jesus prays, verse 18, as you sent me, he says, into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And he's talking about the apostles. He's talking about you and me. He's talking about his disciples. So we are sent into the world. We are on a mission. We are part of God's mission. And we are working for our Lord, right? So we are part of his business. So our today's scripture reading is about several things. So it's about Ananias and Sapphire and also about the apostles being imprisoned and then standing before the council and still doing the will of God, preaching about Jesus, right? So, but, so we began our sermon series with chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Jesus ascends, but he also says to his disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait. Uh, what they were supposed to wait. They were supposed to wait. The, the, the uh, they were supposed to a wait uh, for the Holy Spirit to descend on them. And this is exactly what happens in chapter two. And we can see how this group of people who didn't didn't have uh, a lot of stuff. They didn't have money. They didn't have connections. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have anything. How God is mightily using them. And he moves them to proclaim the truth. And the apostle Peter is speaking the truth. He is talking about Jesus. He says, well, who Jesus is? He is the Messiah. He rose from the dead. And then he gives some scripture verses that support the statement. And immediately the spirit of the Lord is working in the hearts of the listeners. And th more than 3,000 people, 3,000 people join the church. And then the next day, uh, uh, so he, he the, the, they are, uh, I'm sorry, not the next day, but the following days, they are going to the temple and uh, they uh, heal uh, the lame person who was sitting by the beautiful gates in the temple. And then again, uh, more than 5,000 people join. And you can see how... Uh, God is working among the listeners, among the people who live in Jerusalem, how he is preparing their hearts, how he is working on their hearts. And the apostles, their job was to be faithful. And you see their message. You see what they're saying. It's the same simple message. Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, Jesus is God. He rose from the dead. Uh, repent and believe. And we see how God adds people to the church. And again, you need to remember they didn't have a budget, they didn't have any organization, they didn't have any buildings or assets, right? So as an organization, it's very loosely structured. There is no rigid organization. It's God moving the apostles. And they are basically doing uh, spontaneous things that the Spirit moves them to do. And then the result is amazing. Uh, people repent, people join the church. But it's not like, hey, guys, let us sit down and let us come with a plan. And the apostles come with a plan and they say, well, this is our three-year plan and we're going to achieve these numbers in year number one, second year, these numbers, and we will have this graph and, you know, this business-like, you know, approach. We don't see any anything like that. We see that they are basically kind of waiting, you know, where the Lord would move them next. And they respond to that, and God is doing amazing things through them. And this is something that we can learn because we're so much into rigid structures. If you, you know, if you read any any book on church uh, uh, growth, uh, people would say, well, you know what, we have a meeting in April, and then we discuss something. Maybe we should do this, and let us have another meeting, maybe in March, April, March, March, April. April, March, yeah, May. Let us have meeting in May, and okay, uh, maybe we will do this, and then we can. It may take forever, right? All these meetings and discussing and talkings, you know. 
all these things, conversations. So the, this is what we do nowadays, right? So for them, it was like more spontaneous. Okay, Lord calls us to do this. Let us do this. When? Now. When? Tonight, right? So when? To, tomorrow. So this is very interesting to see this spontaneous kind of uh, loose structure, spontaneous, uh, sp spontaneous decisions, uh, kind of Lord calls us do this. Okay, we, we are doing this. So, but then we see these two guys and the Nias and Sapphire. And this is very interesting because um, we know that the book of Acts, like the Gospels, is a historical document. We know it's inspired word of God on the one hand. On the other hand, it's historical document. It, you know, the book of Acts document and record everything what happened with the early church, what we can know, you know, from those records. Not every detail, but all the major things that happened uh, in the early church. And for some reason, this couple is there. So that 2,000 years later, we're reading about them. So what is happening here? Well, first of all, what we see, uh, they were the only ones who decided to lie at that point, right? So they didn't have to give any money. They didn't have to give any money to the church. They decided to do this, but they decided to do that in a twisted way. They decided to lie. Okay, why would people give money to the church? Well, we see that they were of one soul, of one mind. And to me, it's like uh, doing a startup. If you begin a company, so three friends, one has a garage, someone has $1,000, and someone has a car. And the three of them come together, chip in, and they make things happen. You know, small company begins, and it can become multi-million uh, dollars, you know, company, right? So, and this is what is happening. People are moved by the Lord. They understand that God is doing something and they want to be part of this movement. And they would sell houses, fields. We see in the text that uh, Barnabas is one of the guys who sells, you know, his field and later he will join the, the Apostle Paul on the mission trip. So, right? So it's not just, hey, we give money to you, but no, God is doing something. I want to be part of that. Now we have this couple in the niceness of fire. On the one hand, they want to be part of the church. They want to support the church. But their attitude is something like, hey, we have these people. They're doing something. And we're willing to give some money to these people. And this is fundamental mistake when we think the church is just people. For example, think about St. John. Right? Think about this. If we need money or we need some, you know, we need some help. We need help with, uh, you know, the technology. We, we need help with our technology or we need help, financial, financial help or any other help. And people may think, well, I will help St. John, meaning I will help these people. Or I will help Kirk. Or I will help Randy. And very often we think about church as, okay, these people are in charge. Or this pastor is serving here. I will help this pastor. I will help these people, right? Whereas in reality, any church, any true church, it's God's doing. It's God's business. It's, and this is exactly what is happening with Ananias and Sapphire. When Peter says... Who, who put this thought in your mind to lie to the Holy Spirit? He is not saying, why are you lying to me? Because it's not Peter's. It's not Peter's church. It's not John's church. It's not their business. It's God's business, right? And he knows, Peter knows, that the architect, the designer, the builder, the owner, the CEO of church of Christ, of the church of Christ, is God himself, is the Holy Spirit. That is why, my dear friends, if you want to help financially local church or, you know, or serve, you are not, we are not doing it for those people. Uh, we are not helping the cer you know, certain organization. We need to have this attitude that we are doing it for the Lord, right? So 
Do you understand this, the problem that Ananias and Sapphire had? They kind of, they didn't get it. They, they, were not, they were thinking that they are lying to Peter. But they didn't understand that this is God's business, that this is God's project. And they think, okay, why this punishment is so harsh? Because today there are people who lie in the church. Today there are people who do all kinds of crazy things in the church and they don't die right away, right? Well, I think that the reason they died, the punishment was so harsh, and God made sure that their story is in the book of Acts so that even us, 2,000 years later, can read about this story, is a warning. It's a warning for all of us that God doesn't tolerate evil things in his church. And yes, some people do not die right right away when they commit evil things in the church. There are churches nowadays that celebrate abominations that God thinks that God calls abomination, you know, in his word, and they do not die right away. So what? Adam and Eve were told that they will die when they taste the fruit of the tree, and they didn't die right away. It took them hundreds of years to die, but they eventually died. God shows us that he is holy, church is his business, and he is not going to tolerate anything evil or twisted or something that is abomination in his church. And we people can do that like Ananias and Sapphire, but there are consequences to that. And the fact that they died right away, you, you see what, uh, what Luke says. He says, uh, he says that, In verse 11, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. That's the point. The idea is that the the church has the fear of the Lord. Something that today's church in the 21st century lost. Some churches lost that, right? Okay. So, if we were to conclude, you know, to draw conclusions from this story, we would see, okay, God is building his church in the book of Acts, like he is building his church today in the 21st century. Uh, It's his business. It's not my business. Peter never claims that this is his church, or John, right? Or Paul. In 1 Corinthians, actually, Paul rebukes Corinthians that they say, well, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to this, I belong to that, I belong to Peter. He, he, he is telling them off. This shouldn't be like that. You all belong to Christ. So this is not Paul's church. This is not Peter's church. This is God's church. So if I do something for the Lord, if I want to be part of his business, I should have that kind of attitude. I'm helping. I'm serving. I'm not expecting immediate appreciation. I'm not doing it for wrong reasons. I mean, they, I, I, I kind of try to speculate here, but Ananias and Sapphire, they wanted to be part of that community. They kind of felt that it's good to give to the Lord, but uh, their attitude was absolutely wrong. So we should avoid that at all costs. If we do something, if we serve, if we give, if we are involved, we're doing this not for those people who are around us. We're doing it for the Lord, right? So it's for the Lord. So He will, He will, He will give us, uh, He will give us rewards, right? We are not expecting rewards from people. So, so they die, and everybody is afraid to commit sin. But we'll no, not for long. So, in decades, we will see other churches that commit all kinds of sins, but the warning is here for all of us. Take God seriously. This is his business. And then the Holy Spirit keeps working uh, among the apostles, through the apostles, and we see that through them, many wonders and many signs were done. And then again, more and more people were joining the church. And again, the church, it's not a building. It's not a certain organization. It's the body of Christ. So it's people. Church, when we say church in the book of Acts, it's all the followers of Jesus, everybody who believed in him. 
And uh, at the end of chapter 5, you will see that the apostles were preaching from house to house. This is because if you think about thousands of followers of Jesus, there is no one place that can have all of them. They were meeting in uh, house churches or you know, small churches, households. They didn't have dedicated buildings where they can come together and spend time together. They would meet at their private homes, their private houses. So we have this network, this fabric, which is made of all this new converts, these believers in Christ, and it keeps growing. And again, think about this. The apostles don't have a budget, they don't have a plan, they don't have targets, they don't have, you know, numeric goals. They just do what God moves them to do, and the rest is done by God himself, by the Holy Spirit. And they're just mind-blowing. Again, seven times in the book of Acts, we see that people were added to the church, and it's not that Paul or John or any other apostle added them to the church, and it's not that they made their own decisions and they joined the church, but it's the Lord is adding people to the church. He is working simultaneously in the hearts of the hearers, and he is working at the same time through the apostles. And the only thing that he want, that he needs from the apostles, he needs them to be obedient. Okay, so they're preaching, preaching, preaching where? In the temple. And we read that they were in Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch, and this is how it would look like. So it's a covered area, huge one, uh, next to the temple. You can see through the columns, you can see the temple itself. Now think about this. When Jesus, before he's crucified his last week, he is in Jerusalem. Every day he comes to the temple. Every day he preaches at, in the temple. Although he is not formally a priest, he is not a Sadducee, he, he's, he has no formal business with the temple, right? But he is there all the time. And this is where he confronts or is confronted and attacked by the Pharisees, Sadducees, high priests, uh, leaders of the Jewish people. So this is where all that stuff is happening. And then Jesus is arrested and he's crucified. And the apostles know who did this. The apostles know that it's people from the temple who crucified Jesus. And they knew that they hated Jesus. And still, you will see them returning to the temple. I'm thinking, okay, if you know that Jesus was crucified, if you're a disciple of Christ, and you know that Jesus was crucified, you know, by family fair in Allendale, and you know that, you know, township is there and police officers are there and all the authorities are there. And you just know that they hate Jesus and, you, and they just killed Jesus. Would you go preaching about Jesus next to the township, right next door? Would you come back over and over? And this is exactly what the apostles do. The Lord brings them back to the temple right in the midst of all the animus, right? He brings them back. And this amazing miracle that was like a nuclear bomb, you know, when the lame was healed next to the beautiful gates, which are just, just right at the temple. And I, I, think about this. What he is doing, what he is doing. This is very interesting because I think that the key to this answer, what God is doing here, why he's bringing them to the temple is because in chapter 1, he says, stay in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit will descend, you will receive power, and then you will become my witnesses, he says, in Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem, Judea, and Jerusalem is in Judea, and then Samaria, which is neighboring area, and then to the ends of the world, right? And what they're doing, they're saturating Jerusalem with the teachings of Jesus. This is what they're doing. They're saturating, saturating, saturating. In our today's reading, when the council, you know, of the Jewish leaders, when they say to the apostles, you have filled whole Jerusalem with your teaching. Well, this is exactly what is happening, right? The name of Jesus is the message of Jesus is supposed to be elevated 
so that everybody can see and hear this message. So the apostles are not hiding in small villages around Jerusalem, but they go to the center of their political and religious life. And this is where they preach Jesus. Okay, they spend time here. Many people are afraid to join them because they know that it's dangerous. Uh, but people listen to the message, and more and more people become Christians. Multitude of believers. Multitude. So can we learn something from them about this? When the Lord brings you even to a place which is uh, you don't feel comfortable or even you don't feel safe to speak about Jesus, maybe the Lord is using you in that space, right? Even if you are afraid, right? Even if you think, oh, it's not comfortable, it's not safe, you know, but this is where God may use you. This is how he used the apostles. They are spending time there, but let us look at the temple uh, Again, I will show you some more pictures of the temple. So this is Eastern Wall. Solomon's portico is along the wall, but then we see more places like with columns and where people would talk, you know, about God. And this is where the apostles would preach. And this is another picture. So uh, you can see Solomon's porch. And then also you can, I hope, see small red... Uh, arrow, which says beautiful gate, so that you can get an idea how close all these things are to one another, okay? Why Jesus goes directly to the temple, why his disciples are back at the temple all the time. They get arrested, they're persecuted, but they return back. Now see what happens next. They are preaching, 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 and they get arrested. And we see that they get arrested, the high priest rose up and all who were with him, verse 18, 17, that is the party of the Sadducees. Sadducees are the uh, priests, everybody who serves in the temple. And filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. Okay, now they are in the public prison. And the next thing that we read about is that the angel of the Lord uh, helped them escape. And I think, okay, how did it happen? Because several times we will see in the book of Acts that they are arrested and then the angel of the Lord will let them out. And uh, I was thinking about this, trying to find an illustration for this. And uh, my uh, sister decided to share with me what the Lord has done in her life. I knew that, but I kind of forgot. And she didn't know what I'm thinking about, but then the Lord kind of encouraged her to remind me one of the miracles, testimonies that happened in her life. And uh, long story short, so we were building something, and she had to uh, renew our uh, building permit and all the documents, and she was, I don't know, 18, 19, so she was young, she was a young student. I wasn't in the country, so she was the only one who would be able to do that. And uh, uh, she had to go to different bureaucrats and get their signatures and approvals. And it was time sensitive, so she has all her documents, and now she needs to get her last signature. And she goes to the last bureaucrat, you know, in, 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 in a building that has doors that are locked. And they have a code uh, lock on it, right? So you need to know the code, right? And it's at the end of the day, and she comes with all the paperwork, and the doors are locked. And there is no one to unlock them, okay, at all. And it's kind of the end of the working day. It's like, I don't know, maybe already it closes at 5, and it's probably 5. And she's standing there, and nobody is there, and she kind of brings it before the Lord as she, in simple words as she could do it, her word is. And then she says, a guy enters the building, comes to this door, because you need to enter the building, and inside they had uh, uh, another door. And he says, do you need to get in there? And she says, yes. And without asking any question who she is, why she's here, he, he dials, you know, the code, unlocks the door, and 
steps outside. So, and she was able to enter that building and was able to get the signature from the bureaucrat she, she, she needed. Uh, th there are more things to this because it, the whole thing was kind of orchestrated by God. But think about this. What are the chances of someone showing up at the moment when you need it, unlocking the door for you, and then disappearing? So it's very low chances, right? It's not that this person was going into the building. It's not that he was leaving the building. It's someone who just stepped in from the outside, unlocked the door, and they just walked away. And when you think about this, okay, Lord, you can send your angels, angels not just spiritual beings, but even people, because angelos, angel, it's someone who is sent to you. It can be a human being. God can use angels. And I think, okay, that is, I think that something similar happened to the apostles when an angel unlocked the doors for them. I wouldn't be surprised that the Lord was using someone to unlock the doors and let them outside at the right time. But there is more to that. It's very interesting. Look what happens next. Uh, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. Okay, opened the prison doors, good, and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And you see, they don't say Christianity. They say uh, the way or the life of this life. So it's not, they, they, they don't themselves Christians yet. They will call, they will be called Christians for the first time in Antioch. But now it's about this life, about Jesus, about Jesus. And then I think, okay, what is happening here? We see this group of people who are moved by the Lord. They got arrested. The Lord sends an angel so that they can be let out. And then the angel tells them what to do next. And I think, okay, is it something that we experience in our church life? Is it something that is normal to us or not? And I think, okay, what is normal to us? To, na to us, if we wanted to go to the temple, if we were the apostles, we'd say, look, let us get together, let us discuss, let us talk about all the pros and cons. Is it dangerous? Is it safe? Does it make sense? Let us vote. Let us have another meeting, right? This is how we handle things. And here, God is basically using an angel, I don't know, is it a you know, supernatural being or maybe it's just a human being who is inspired by the Lord. And the angel tells them that someone whom the Lord sent to them into their life not only gave them freedom from their circumstances, but also told them what to do. And they said, yeah, we will do that. They knew that it's from the Lord. And you find them back in the temple in the morning and they're preaching again. Isn't that interesting? You know, when I became a, a Christian uh, many years ago, uh, when the Lord uh, found me many years ago, I remember I was in my home uh, city and uh, I was walking down the street uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, nobody's there. Absolutely, all the streets are empty. And then I was kind of deep in my thoughts, kind of uh, sad, you know, something. I, I needed some encouragement from the Lord. And then out of nowhere, I see a guy who is walking towards me. Okay, we, we walked past one another like this. And I kept walking and he kept walking. And, and then he stops, turns around and runs to me. And then he says something like this, you know, I want to tell you that Jesus knows you and he loves you. And then he kind of leaves. And I think, what is happening here? It's not that you have a guy who randomly tells people Jesus loves you. He walked past me, then something happened in his heart, 
The Lord was nudging him to do something. He didn't know who I am. Maybe I'm a criminal. Maybe I don't know. But he turns around. He runs after me. And he gives me this message. Okay? And the message was very timely and very encouraging. So that was the message from the Lord for me at that moment. And I think, okay, here we have this angel of the Lord who tells the apostles to go to the temple. Okay? So my question is, are we listening when the Lord is telling us? This is a good question, right? When the Lord is telling us, are we listening? Or we want to be like super prudent and super wise and just plan everything and make sure that we talked to everybody and we voted on everything. And it's just like, or is there this element of being spontaneous and kind of responsive to when the Lord is reaching out to us? That's very interesting. They had it in their church, right? This is how the Lord was moving them. And then they're preaching in the temple and, and they, they get arrested again. And uh, of course, uh, the, uh, so yeah, they are before the uh, council and they tell them, well, okay, we told you not to preach about this name. And now you filled the whole, you know, Jerusalem with this teaching. So, and so on and so forth. And then they uh, try to threaten uh, the apostles. And the apostles say again, we should listen to God, not to man. So they understand that they are in God's business, right? So we listen to God. We do what God tells us to do. And they t- preach to the, to, to the council as well. Well, Jesus is the Messiah. You crucified him. He rose from the dead. He's Savior. He, is, he calls to repentance and so on and so forth. And then the council gets so angry, they want to kill them. I'm not surprised. They want to kill them. And then think about this. You are with the apostles before that council, and they want to kill you. And you see all these people who hate Jesus and who crucify Jesus. And of course, they hate you now. And then you think, okay, I'm done. So it's the end of my life, right? They want to kill me. And that's, they kill Jesus, they can kill me. And then something amazing happens. One of them, Gamaliel, one of them, respected guy. We know that Paul was his student from, I think, Acts chapter 22. He stands up and he says, guys, wait a minute. Don't kill them. Let them go. And then he says something like this. He says, so the, 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 uh, uh, he says something like this. So in the present case, he says to his fellow council members. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from this man and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Can you imagine that? You are surrounded by enemies, and all of a sudden you see this voice. The Lord uses this guy. He stands up and he says this. And they will not kill the apostles that day. They will let them go. They will beat the apostles, but they will let them go. Which means even if you are surrounded by enemies, God can move one of your enemies to defend you. And of course, it's God's doing. It's God working in the midst of the enemies, right? You may think there is no way they will let us off the hook. They will let us go. No chance. And then one of your enemies is moved by the Lord. Not only he is moved by the Lord, but he also says this prophecy. If it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Ah you might even be found opposing God. And we know, because we live 2,000 years later, we know that they were not able to overthrow the teachings of Jesus, right? It's a prophecy that to us is a sign that Christianity is true. 
right? That God is behind his church, that it's God who was building his church in the book of Acts that exists to this day. Isn't that amazing? Now, think about this. The book of Acts shows us that church of God is not human business. It's God's business. God himself builds it. He draws people to his church. It is very important, especially today when there are small churches and they are shrinking and they say, oh, we have so many old people, we don't have young people. We need to attract people somehow. Maybe music, maybe, you know, this, maybe that, maybe what can we do? What can we do? So, but we need to understand that these people in the book of Acts, they didn't have all that. But all they had, they had God, and they were willing to let God to use them in any circumstance where God would send them. Temple, we go to temple. Out of Jerusalem, we go out of Jerusalem, right? And they come to a certain place, and all they do, they proclaim the truth. And the rest is done by God. Thousands of people joining the church. So this is how it worked, and this is how it works today, and this is what we can learn from them. So, let us pray about this. But before we pray, let me show you a summary for St. John. In the light of me uh, leaving, so I was thinking, okay, when we look at the book of Acts and we see how God is working with his church, what can we see you know, for St. John. So we can see that at the center of St. John, uh, as God's church, should be authentic fellowship of believers, like they had in the book of Acts, praying for one another, dedicated to the teachings of the apostles, having authentic fellowship. This is at the center. This is what may, would make church church, right? Out of that, priority two, number two, would be Sunday service. It's important, but it's not priority number one. And then ministries and outreach. So let us pray about this because I want to see God's church uh, growing and flourishing. But that also, what we can do, that also depends on us in the sense that we need to align with the will of God and with his plan. Let us pray about this. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, we thank you so much for all your blessings, your mercy, your grace. You're so, so good to us. Jesus, you sent us into the world. We know we cannot do it ourselves. We need the guidance, support, encouragement, comfort of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we want to learn from the apostles, from the early church, to listen to you, to be more spontaneous, to be quick on our feet, to prioritize fellowship, prayer, your word. Jesus, we see that you can do amazing things. Even if we are weak, even if we don't have enough resources, all the glory belongs to you when you are doing those things. We glorify you, Jesus. We glorify your name. Lead us. Guide us, Jesus. We want to be part of your mission. It's not about people. It's about you. It's about you first and then people whom you bring into our churches, into our lives. But without you, we cannot do anything. We need you, Jesus. We need your Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith to life everlasting.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.